Well, welcome to Charlotte, the Queen City. You may not have known that. It was named when the settlers came for, appropriately so, the Queen of England. <clears throat> Charlotte was married to King George III. You may have heard of him. He was the monarch during that little time we call the American Revolution. So we drove them out, but we kept the name, Charlotte. We also wanted to honor the queen, and so we named our county after the area from which she originally came. She was from northern Germany, a place called mecklenburg strelitz and so you are in Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, Queen City, welcome! <laughs> and to be more exact, you're actually in Matthews, North Carolina, one of the top 10 suburban cities in the United States to retire in. So take a look around while you're here. <laughs> it's a joy to be in this, uh, one of our really uh, dynamic and vital churches. Uh, and as Ken said, uh, this was a, a home for my children for a while. And Ken actually remembers I was standing about right here when he allowed me to baptize my first grandbaby. And so this is a special place, and Ken, thank you for uh, all that you have done and for this wonderful team and for our team uh, here in Western North Carolina to receive you and to host you uh, for this time. I am blessed to have the privilege to serve Christ as the Bishop of the Charlotte area. It's a joy to welcome the 2014 School of Congregational Development to our area and to an exciting place. When we add all of our professing members, baptizing members, constituent members, saints and sinners who come to the United Methodist churches, there are about 360,000 United Methodists across western North Carolina in 1,100 churches. And it is an exciting place because we don't all speak English. We have people from all over the world. And we have congregations that minister in so many different ways uh, to people ar around this area. Charlotte's home to a lot of cutting-edge things as well as a lot of traditional organizations. It's a major financial center for the East Coast. There's industry, there's recreation, there's entertainment. There's a major airport. And there are traffic jams. And there's a never-ending stream of road construction. You may have encountered a couple of those on your way in. It's also the home of the United States National Whitewater Training Center. Many of the Olympic athletes in those sports come here to train. And it's also the home of NASCAR. The NASCAR Hall of Fame in Uptown Charlotte is worth a visit. Not worth a visit to skip any of these seminars, but later on, <laughs> it's also the reason that uh, this, this theme for the School of Congregational Development this year became the race, R-A-C-E. Here it is. Because we believe and we want to consider these themes through these next few days that vital churches... Vital churches are relevant, authentic, Christ-centered, and engaged with the world. Vital leaders are relevant, authentic, Christ-centered, and engaged. We pray that as we explore those ideas and themes, we will begin to get a sense of what God is calling us to in this time and in this place, wherever it is that we have the privilege of serving Christ. So whether the image is for you climbing in a car and turning left at 200 miles an hour or canoeing or kayaking down some treacherous waters, what most of us experience is that life sometimes feels out of control. And we are racing at breakneck speed towards something. We have a hard time with some of that because current reality feels like we're just going so fast that we're not sure what our destination is. In the words of Brene Brown, we are crazy busy and we grow impatient 
I saw it this morning. I'm sitting at a traffic light. I'm third in line. Before the light turned green, the person in front of me was honking at the person in front of them. I wanted to say, what? We're impatient. Let's get moving. And if the Wi-Fi is too slow, we're lost. Or maybe it's our gadgets that are too old. You know, we've only had them seven months, but they're too old. We're all running a race. And it may feel like we're falling farther and farther behind. I want to flip that metaphor a bit. You've come to Charlotte. So I want us to think about the Apostle Paul making his way to Corinth. Scholars list a number of reasons of why Paul might have wound up in Corinth for a lot of reasons. It was a major city. It was on a major trade route. There were people coming into Corinth from all over the world. There was a large Jewish population. And that was the group to whom Paul always went first. Some have even suggested that Paul might have gone there because Corinth was the home of the Isthmian Games. They were held every two years. And so Paul might have seen that as an opportunity to greet people from all over the world coming to compete. And there in the shadow of the athletic stadium, standing perhaps next to the Hippodrome, where all of the athletes compete, Paul got an image, and he used a metaphor not only in his letters to Corinth, but in many of his other letters, he talks about the race, a metaphor for our life in Christ, for our life of discipleship, running a race. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, just one of those paragraphs. There are other places in Paul's letters, but listen, don't you know? Don't you know that all the runners in the stadium run, but only one gets the prize? So, run to win. Everyone who competes practices self-discipline and everything. The runners do this to get a crown of leaves that shrivel up and die. But we do it to receive a crown that never dies. So now, this is how I run. Not without a clear goal in sight. I fight like a boxer in the ring, not like someone who's shadow boxing, but rather I am landing punches on my own body, subduing it. I do this to be sure that I myself won't be disqualified after preaching to others. I just have this hunch that Paul might have been a spectator at some of the events of the Isthmian Games. Now we know that Paul was a a tent maker, so he probably didn't have any money. He probably stood outside trying to buy a ticket from somebody, hoping that it was a decent seat and he wouldn't get arrested. But I just have this hunch that he went in, he saw the runners, he saw the people competing with, in all the various events, and he thought, here's a lesson. Here's a lesson for the churches. Run to win. Now, in those days, it was not gold, silver, and bronze. It was just a wreath of leaves to the winner. So Paul wants to encourage everyone who's a part of this discipleship life in Christ to run to win. And then to understand that as disciples, we have to do the same thing athletes do. We have to train. We have to discipline ourselves. We have to offer preparation. We have to exhibit the same kind of energy and effort and commitment in order to reach the finish line. It's out there. Head for the goal, for the prize that does not wither, that does not die. How then shall we run? John Green is a young author who wrote a 
best-selling novel that appealed to young adults. Some of you may have read it. It's called The Fault in Our Stars. It made a very successful motion picture earlier this year. It's an amazing story that John wrote about Hazel and Gus. A wonderful love story of teenagers made all the more amazing because they meet in a cancer support group. And Hazel carries around with her constantly her oxygen tank. And Gus jokes often about his prosthetic leg. And they meet and they fall in love. It's a wonderful story. In the June issue of Fast Company, John Green was interviewed, talked about his life, talked about how the story came to be written and, and how he is already beginning to, to be in relationship with all the fans and the movie and all that goes with it. I was fascinated by John Green. So I just want to lift up a couple of things that he said because I think he nailed a few things that I needed to hear, share them with you. He has a passion. He wants to, I'm going to quote it here, he, he, he is building and maintaining a passionate audience. Got it? Here is an author who wants to build and maintain a passionate audience. I want to build and maintain passionate audience disciples, passionate congregations who are running the race for Jesus Christ. How do you build and maintain a passionate audience? A couple of things that he said I share with you. In big print, it says big print right there. I'm not making this stuff up. John Green says, phoniness is deadly. Phoniness is deadly. If your goal, he said, is real connection, are you hearing this, church? If your goal is real connection, never pretend to be something you aren't. You have to be authentic with your audience. And so our theme for these days together include two very important words, being relevant and being authentic. How dare we think we can build a vital church, an exciting church, a passionate discipleship team if we're not relevant and authentic. I'm one of the hundreds of thousands of subscribers to Seth Godin's blogs. On August the 4th, just a few weeks ago, he wrote this. It is essential to be consistent. People can tell when you shift your story and your work in response to whatever is happening around you. Particularly when you say whatever you need to say to get through to the next cycle. Now we Methodists never do that, right? Some of you will tell your superintendent something in October and something different in February. I take that to mean you know people who've done that. You've never done that. <laughs> Phoniness is deadly. We have to figure out ways to connect with real people. I think that's one of the things that just strikes you so much about the story of Hazel and Gus. They are not about fame and fortune and well-toned bodies and superheroes. They're just people. Real life people. Real life people who are right around those facilities that we have. People who are wounded and scarred. People who are hurting, people who are less than perfect by cultural standards, connection, being consistent. 
So I was trying to think through, what does it mean to be authentic? And I did what many of you probably do. I googled authentic. And, you know, millions of references. But right there on the front page, I saw it. Authentic church. I thought, this is great. It's going to write my sermon for me. (laughs) Authentic church. This is great. Let me look this up. Turns out it's a real church. In White Plains, New York. Authentic church. I can only speculate why and how they came up with that name. Authentic church. But I was struck by their core identity that's printed on the front of their website page. Know God, grow together, show love. Got it? Authentic? Know God, grow together, show love? I am amazed at how many non-denominational independent churches sound and act more like John Wesley than some of those who have the name on the sign. Relevant, authentic, making connections, being consistent. So to build a passionate audience church, phoniness is deadly. And then he says, don't settle for the ordinary. Don't settle for the ordinary. Green says that requires imagination. I believe we, developing churches, need some fresh imagination. Something more than just rambling ideas. I, I, this is pretty good. I woke up last night and thought, eh, maybe that'll work. No, 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 no. Christ-centered, spirit-empowered imagination. What difference might it make if our imagination is fueled by being centered in Jesus Christ? In his second letter to the church at Corinth, and just so you know, I took the class. It might have been his third or fourth letter, but we call it the second letter to the Corinthians. Paul names what drives him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. The love of Christ compels me. Other translations say, we are urged on by the love of Christ. We are controlled by the love of Christ. Paul understood that his life was going to be driven by God's love in Christ, in him, out into the world. It's what drives us as Wesleyans. There's nothing ordinary about that. I think... Wesley, I think John Wesley could have settled for ordinary. I mean, he could have been a priest, probably had his life following his dad at Epworth. He was already a fellow at Lincoln. He could have settled. He could have, in good 21st century fashion, just settled down, drawn a salary, got the benefits, and built a pension fund. And just settle for the ordinary. But John was compelled. He was urged on. He was controlled by this amazing gift of God's grace in his life that he then spread across the world. Compelled by Christ. There's nothing ordinary about that. We're here to talk about developing vital churches. I want to develop extraordinary churches, not ordinary ones. Ordinary churches still think it's 1960. 
Ordinary churches build fences around their property. Ordinary churches seem to have plenty of money to fund cemeteries. Ordinary churches turn inward. They, 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 they create rules. And most of the rules have one of two words in them, either shall or don't. Ordinary churches keep doing the same thing just because. Don't settle for the ordinary. Let's be extraordinary churches that are compelled and sent out, driven out, motivated, inspired by the love of God. Extraordinary churches take risks for Jesus. They understand themselves to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ. And so they extend themselves in ministry among the poor and the vulnerable and the outcast and the downcast. Extraordinary churches act with holy boldness. Holy because it is centered in and inspired by Christ. Bold because most of the time it's going to go against the prevailing norm. Extraordinary churches don't settle for the ordinary. If we're going to build and maintain passionate audiences, vital churches don't settle for the ordinary. But then he adds, then John Green adds, we have to be passionate about making a difference. This is an author. Nowhere in the article does it talk about faith, but he's got it. We have to be passionate about making a difference. And then he says, in order to do that, we have to keep creating. We have to keep creating. Never be content. All of those efforts around making a difference mean that we have to be engaged with the world. Engaged with those right around us. Too many churches in our connection have decided to disengage. They've withdrawn, they've circled the wagons, they've shut the doors, mainly for a couple of reasons. We're scared about what's out there and we don't want to go out there. And we're scared about who's out there and we don't want them to come in here. To follow the way of Jesus, to live into our Wesleyan heritage, loving God and loving neighbor, we have to engage the community and the world, make a difference, make a difference. So we want to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. You have to understand something about me. I am part of that radical, rebellious 60s world, 1960s that is, age 62. And so I, I just had this notion that we, general conference, and I voted for it, let ourselves off the hook when we added the phrase, transform the world. Because most of us are going to sit there and go, yeah, that's a great idea. But it doesn't affect me. I mean, how am I going to transform the world? It's a big, hairy, audacious mission. What can I do? So, folks in Western North Carolina know I've been saying, you know, we need to make disciples of Jesus Christ to transform hearts and lives and transform communities the world God will take care of. But if we start transforming the community right around our church... What a difference it might make in our county, in our state, maybe even the world. We have to engage where we are. I get to hear, and you'll hear over the next few days, some of the 
really inspiring stories and witnesses of what's happening in churches across western North Carolina. I'm here today to tell you that right now in Mecklenburg County in the greater metro Charlotte area, there are thousands, there are literally thousands of children who are going to be headed back to school in a couple of weeks with brand new backpacks, all their supplies, and a new <coughs> pair of shoes, courtesy of United Methodist in this area engaging people. I heard this wonderful story of these of, of disciple church members putting shoes on the feet of children and then praying for them. It's Wesley. I get to hear stories. I got to sit not too long ago at one of our welcome tables. It's a little ministry that started over in the mountains. And now has spread to so many of our churches. A welcome table in the middle of the week where congregations, churches come together to feed the hungry and the homeless. It's not just going through a line and getting a peanut butter sandwich. They get a meal. I, I sat in one of the meals. I mean, salad with fresh tomatoes and hot meat and hot vegetables. And the greatest thing was they were welcomed in and the guests were seated and the church members served them and then sat down with them. I sat next to a couple who literally live in the mountains, on the mountain, no home. And they're there to be welcomed. We have to engage the community. We have new faith communities springing up, not in some of those traditional ways, but built solely around mission and meeting the needs of people, engaging relevant, authentic, Christ-centered engagement with the world. The Wesley Study Bible refers to this as faithful living and then has this comment. Faithful living is a series of choices, decisions, commitments, and changes that move us toward God. Faithful living, building and maintaining passionate audiences, passionate disciples, vital, thriving churches. Faithful living, a series of choices, decisions, commitments, and changes that move us toward God, that take us toward the finish line. Faithful living, it goes on, is edgy, unpredictable, adventuresome, and scary. Which is why we don't have many vital churches. Scary? Do we really want to do that? How can we not? We're called, my friends, to be a passionate group of faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, serving Christ in vital churches. It's time to be relevant, authentic, Christ-centered, and engaged. My sisters and brothers, the flag is up. The race is on. You ready? Let's run to win. Run to win.